partnership. And so when we started about, this is our third year, so we're really, really, really young research station, really young university. Um, but the first piece that we got was Dan actually got an NSF planning grant. And what that enabled us to do is bring all the stakeholders together to develop our strategic planning mission. And that's been a huge piece for us. And so we had over about 70 to 80 folks come together and then do breakout groups and really set the priorities for what we wanted to do out here. And emphasizing that it's university run research station, that's our priority is undergraduate research. However, everybody's invited and everybody's incorporated into this, um, to, to the research station. So we develop our mission statement, all that kind of jazz. Um, and as we've been growing, you know, our first year we had about a thousand user days, second year about 3,000, and this past year we had about 5,000 user days, um, which is a, quite a bit of different, um, quite a bit of activity out here. And if you break up some of our, our major activities out here, we have educational programming. Um, so like Sean mentioned, um, one thing that we've been trying to do is programming that is real world data collection. And so if you're a high school teacher or if you're a university uh, instructor, we can plug you into ongoing programs. And it really makes it easy for people to get involved and to collect data. And so Russell mentioned long-term inventory and monitoring and so those are the things that we've been identifying. So we have sandy beach ecology, intertidal ecology, uh, vegetation monitoring, photo point analysis, tree demography, all these pieces and all this data is being generated by non-specialists. And so whether you're, hey, whether you're an English major or whether you're an art major, whether you're a biology major or an anthropologist, you are contributing to this system. And the data you collect will ideally inform natural and cultural resource management. And so that's a big piece, is that right away you are a scientist, but you also provide a new perspective. And so for, say, the photo point analysis, they're going out there and collecting photos of a variety of different areas associated with the hikes. We can see change through time. We can quantify that with vegetation change, ground cover, et cetera. So there's a scientific piece to that. However, we also have all these students do a reflective photo and a writing piece. And so now we can populate a map, an ArcGIS map, of these photo points, the cultural layers, the environmental science majors, but also something that many times scientists doesn't pull in, a spiritual reflection piece. And so all these photos of these students and individuals are geo-referenced and along, along with their writing. So we can see if certain places on these islands resonate with certain groups of people or certain emotions. Um, and so that's an artistic piece and that's an English piece incorporated into a scientific protocol. And so these interdisciplinary approaches are what we're all about here. And we were just contacted by a guy, uh, uh, Chumash, from out of the area that's moving back that is, um, is a linguist, and he wants to give us all the historic names for all the different um, structures out here and, and locations out here. So that'll be folded in, too. And so, so people actually now see that as a resource, this sort of growing um, mm -hmm. And we applied for um, you know National Endowment of the Arts Grant, right? Mm -hmm. And so that was me, an art teacher, and environmental science, again, having these concepts, but doing this interdisciplinary type approach. Um, another thing that we do out here and that we really emphasize is undergraduate research. And so that across, again, spans disciplines. And so what's great about for these students, whether they're environmental science, anthropology, business, you know, um, English, is that they're working hand in hand, not only with a faculty member, but a professional. And that their data that they're accumulating, their project is contributing to the park immediately, ideally. Um, and so, you know, students who are doing a year-long capstone project really are performing master's level work, guaranteed, and provide an opportunity of not like just a project that will sit on the shelf, and never get used, but immediately gets implemented um, in his real world. And so that's a huge uh, piece out here. Yeah, a, a real example is we spent really no time on the Torrey Pines. And since the, the eradication of deer and elk, we still spent no time on the Torrey Pines. It wasn't until the university decide to have a capstone student look at the Torrey Pines. And now we actually know how many Torrey Pines we have. We know their health condition. We also have learned that they're actually spreading. Yeah. Is that they're, and they're doing really well. And now I pay more attention to Torrey Pines and I've realized, oh my gosh, ever since we got rid of the deer and elk, they actually are flourishing. But we have, and now we actually have data that can show it. The park did not invest in that, the university did. Yeah. And that's, I mean, that's the nice thing about this park, right, is here's the rarest pine species or one of the rarest pine species in the world. We go in there and maybe the estimate's like 5,000 individuals. Well, we go in there as a team with national, the National Park staff, um, USGS staff, 
Clark faculty members and undergrads, and we find out 22,000 individuals in this forest, 80% of the population in the world. The beautiful thing about these islands is you can offer, they offer a sense of hope, right? Um, you know, like I, when I, I taught as a PhD student, I taught environmental science at Berkeley. And at that case, at the very end of that semester, I realized I did something wrong. Because here's like bright-eyed, bushy-tailed undergrads saving the world <laughs> at the end. They're like, what can we do? Like human population, you know, habitat destruction, all these different pieces. And part of that reflected the system I worked in in Hawaii. Well, here, uh, um, foxes just got delisted, the fastest recovery in the and you know, ever. This island. Yeah, of, of all of, islands. Of all islands. Yeah. Yeah. Delisted across all yeah, the right. islands. Right. Well, in the, like Russell mentioned, the marine protected areas, right? Uh, strategy um, that pulled in all the stakeholders to identify where the MPAs are. And after 10 years, amazing results. You got a dynamic system of Santa Rosa Island. For the first time, grazers introduced grazers are out here after 150 years. This island is in a dynamic state, really changing. Right when the university comes on board, so there's perfect research opportunities to document the recovery process. And so when students leave here, regardless of what they've been doing, they have the opportunity to nurture the landscape, contribute to the landscape, and acknowledge the land that they inhabit. And they leave with a sense of hope, and ideally a new sense of place and a new sense of community itself. And so that's the biggest transformation that we try to offer out here. Um, so for undergraduate research, for instance. Can I just, I yeah, just with this, these, you know, I'm, I'm thinking back to the book that uh, when the killings died. Yeah. <laughs> How do you, so so you have um, you have to get rid of the elk to to restore the island back to what it looked like, at, mm -hmm. you know, a thousand years ago, a hundred years ago, and but you have to deal with the political ramifications of the species you're deciding didn't belong there to get back to the time frame you were. How how do you and what, I guess that's really more of a national park question. <laughs> but that's, that is, um, I mean, what, I love that to book, tell this. Let's say Cosfish, I love to tell that story because the real story is actually better than the book. <laughs> and uh, About the snake? Because that was an awful. Yeah. Oh, that was awful. <laughs> I don't think that's real. That's not a real okay, part of this. Okay, but that, was, that <laughs> was like my, oh, my God. Well, but, that, but that's exactly, you take that same snake thing, and that's, exa that's really the big story. It's really a deer and elk story. So, you know, it just so happens that that was the next story to think about. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> so we can talk about that. I'd be happy I, since I lived through the whole thing. Yeah. But that's to, it. uh, it's an interesting comparison, about. these islands and what you would have to do versus an island that's inhabited, right. you know, like Hawaii or Catalina. And now you have a cultural connection to pigs. Well, good luck ever eradicating that species. And now you're fencing and you're doing probably about 60% of the budget in Hawaii volcanoes is fencing and you get bog coming in and destroying the fence. So it's like this, this never-ending system. We're out here, the National Park has done a phenomenal job and it had the opportunity to remove that threat. And now the island, I mean, come back in 10 years. You know, this island's gonna be completely different. But what, Even how in do the you... last three, four years, mm -hmm. just, I mean, I'm, I'm a political scientist, not a, not a biologist, but it's evident right. the changes. Mm -hmm. How do we know any of us are healthy? Well, it's the vital signs. What's your pulse? You know, what's her temperature? Her eyes dilated? You know? Um, is she breathing? And so that's how kind of the inventory monitoring system's broken up into these vital signs. Well, Sandy Beach, intertidal, fox monitoring, native bench, tree demography, climate. And these are projects that we've all jumped on as undergraduates um, that they can plug right into. And so we have a variety of projects, over a dozen, that are legacy projects that students repeatedly plug into, provide data, with the oversight of the National Park, or myself or somebody else, and now we're developing these long-term data sets into the future, uh, which should help, uh, hopefully, um, with natural and cultural resource management. Looks like we have our, some of our folks coming in. Their visitors don't represent the demography of our country. That's right. um, and that's a huge issue. And for this park in particular, I grew up in the area, big family, and there's never, I never would have dreamed about the opportunity to get out to these islands, right? There's no way my family would afford it. There's a socioeconomic divide of that boat ticket. And so this park, they've been doing a really good job, but there's still this interface of the local community who should be the stewards, who should be the, the people fighting for the integrity of this park. Well, why would they care if they don't have access, if they don't have that experience out here? And so that's what our award was about. That's what working with the National Park is about is we're working not only with the undergrads at our university who are mostly from the local counties,
but we have an education program that we've established with NOAA and school district funding in a partnership that we developed, and it's called Crossing the Channel. And so we've worked with over 600 students, been in the classrooms for over 3,000 hours. Really? Even the, um, the very end? Is there a number for the... 10, 10. 10, 10. 10, 10. 10, 10. 10. Yeah, so like today, um, we currently, we have two faculty members working in Oxnard State Park um, with two classes from Fremont. And so that's run through the research station distance learning opportunity. So these are students who have never maybe even had access to the beach, but they're going to be doing professional research. They're doing marine debris protocol with NOAA, they're doing microplastics, and they're doing Sandy Beach ecology. And so that's all funded through the research station, but provides a distance learning activity. And so these students are going to be doing a series of activities on the mainland with the culminating activity of coming out here at the research station and working with us. Um, and so those students, which is really cool, are working with high school students, professionals, and junior high schools. And initially, they don't see themselves as scientists. Maybe they see a scientist as an old white guy in a lab coat. But at the end, they recognize themselves as scientists, but not only scientists, but active, active members of the scientific community, stewards of the landscape, contributing scientists, because they've been collecting data this whole time. Um, and so that's one of the processes we've had. And, and thinking about longitudinal progresses, we've had junior high school students working in this program. Now as high school students, they're revisiting this program. And we've had students that were recruiting to CI in environmental science, biology, and anthro that have done our program because now they see the pathway, they see that there's jobs available, and they're confident that they're able to contribute. And so that's that's one of our, our big programs that we have when it comes to distance learning, distance learning and, and working with local school districts, whether it's elementary or high school districts. Um, if you look at our research use, just to kind of do a quick summary, um, Again, we continue to increase. We had a 45% increase this past year in use, and the vast majority of our use is undergrads, so that's our priority and that's our emphasis, particularly CI students. And again, we had, um, we've almost had every single program out here. And so we're consistently going back to faculty members and seeing how they can plug in. And so whether that's anthropology, which is a pretty easy fit, but communications comes out here, and this is something that uh, Russell mentioned, I work with a communi communications faculty member and we did a sibling trip. So here's students from CI bringing their siblings out here and in the data it's recorded, you know, like if you integrate your family, well that's a much more long lasting experience. And so now we're integrating into the community with that trip. Or whether it's English, we do environmental lit, we have them contribute to the photo monitoring program, uh, performing arts we're going to be working with this year, mathematics, statisticians are working with some of the long term monitoring data. And so there's always a way to plug in for all these disciplines. And I think that's the new kind of um, overall goal and realization in this community is, man, it shouldn't be driven by biology, environmental science, anthropology. Every single discipline should have a perspective and a buy-in to this system, right? In a connection. So when you're saying communications, shouldn't those students be doing more like uh, social, you know, yeah. Twitter, or Facebook. Yes, and we've also they had, should be. Yeah, <laughs> we've also had a student uh, work as an independent project with our social media, our out, our um, our programming. We've had business students look at our, our processes and protocols, um, our marketing, and so everything. All these students are contributing to the welfare of the station and the progression. Because the, I mean, if all the kids that have been here are able to contribute on Facebook, like if, mm -hmm. uh, in an ongoing way, keep everybody connected. Yeah. So is that happening? Yeah, oh, yeah, good. for sure. Yeah, and so we what's have the, students. What's the Twitter handle? Of ours? Yeah. SRRS. Oh. Yeah. And so we have our social media form, <laughs> and most of it's driven by students, um, in addition to some of us who contribute every once in a while. So was that a test, Jackie? Yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I just, just wanted to make yeah. sure yeah. they're doing their job. No, for sure. <laughs> it is, and it's a big piece, right? How do we communicate with that next generation? What's the appropriate No, it wasn't a test. It's when I do my tweet. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> S-R-I-R-S. -I yeah. Okay. Um, Santa Rosa Island Research, Research Station. Station. Okay. And another piece I think I just wanted to emphasize is how many partners we have. And so coming back to the creation of this research station, those individuals had a buy-in. They had a voice in what the station, what the priorities, what the mission of the station was. And ever since then, they've contributed and utilized this research station. And so if you look at partners, we have school districts ranging from LA, Ventura County, to up to Santa Barbara County. We have universities, over 27 universities used this research station last year. Um, so we're developing partnerships among faculty members and research opportunities for our faculty and other faculty. Um, we have governmental and then nonprofit. And so again, this is a research station that's utilized by a whole bunch of people. And more importantly, 
it occup it's occupied by a variety of institutes at the same time, right? And that gets these discussions, whether it's between two faculty members or researchers going, whoa, there's this collaboration happening, or whether it's a student that gets an internship or a job, which we've had plenty with these conversations and these partnerships going on right now. Like we've had a student get hired by Cornell um, working with some of the, um, the pine species or a student that got an internship with NOAA, right? And these conversations start here, these relationships start here, which is pretty phenomenal. So um, how do you look though at government partners? Because obviously you have the National Park Service, but um, it, I mean, I look at something like microplastics mm -hmm. and a lot of the research should be transformed, should be, they should be looking at policy that might help yeah. um, these issues. So is there, is there, I mean, that's, I guess, maybe the political science right. part, or but how, no. how do you push policies at the state and federal level? Yeah, then? so that's, I mean, that's a perfect example. So we just got a, through the research station and partners, environmental science faculty, we got a two-year grant, NOAA grant, looking at marine debris. Um, on that grant, we, we've integrated anthropology, art, and then environmental science and biology. So it's an interdisciplinary grant, which um, currently I'm the lead on. That research with Sandy Beach Ecology, um, micro and macro debris is informing, informing policy. And so we're working directly with Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary and have a direct conversation with the commercial and recreational fishermen here. And so the idea is to look at how marine debris has changed over these past 20 years and just our pilot data, marine debris has increased by about 40%. So now we've identified the culprit, the issue. Well, what's the issue? There are lobster traps, derelict fishing gear, an issue for the local ecology. Well, that over the next two years, we'll be able to say this, this is the impact it's ha having on local habitat and, and organisms. Well, what are, what are policy um, that we can provide to limit derelict fishing gear, right? The first step of it though is identifying whose issue it is and if it's having an impact locally. And so we've been working with Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary with that conversation. Um, one of the first things that's gonna be happening is next year, after this year, they're gonna be reducing the number of pots or traps by about half that each permit holder can do, right? Lobster traps. Lobster traps, yeah. And so we'll be seeing this next year, well, is that having an impact? Is that a policy that's actually benefiting lo the local ecology? If not, um, we'll have the data to provide it and then go back to the policy table to see if we can we can limit some of these impacts. But, for but it's also accountability on the traps. Exactly. You have to show that you have the same number you started with. Right. Because right right now there's not much incentive if you lose your traps and then they end up ghost fish what we call ghost fishing. They're still fishing. It's that they have no buoy to the top. And if they end up in shallow water, cormorants are swimming down into them, going into the trap, then they can't get out. Mm -hmm. So we're drowning seabirds. So we, I mean, and it's unknowing to the fishermen because they don't know. They don't know where their trap is. Right. 